with. Uh, he is a researcher here at MDIVL, and he's working on zebrafish. He's working on stress response. Uh, he's very much interested in long-term effects on animals, but he'll talk about his first love, actually. He'll talk about metamorphosis uh, is an ancient, ancestral, environmentally informed characteristic of animal development. And you'll tell us in a minute which animal he has been working. Uh, he will talk about. He has been working on other animals. You'll see this in a moment. Uh, and uh, he came to us from the Sowers Institute. Uh, originally, he trained in Switzerland. His first job was actually playing the trombone in beer gardens in Switzerland. So uh, <laughs> we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. I put this on. Is, is there are there people online? Or can I? I I'd rather uh, not hold. All right. So that's supposed to be a movie. I don't know. It doesn't seem to be working, but uh, uh, yes, it's a movie I took, uh, oh, I, I don't know, over 10 years ago. Does anyone know what that is? Well, that's close. It's not quite a seer. That's right. So that's a, a baby sand dollar. Let's see. Is there a, well, oh, here we go. Actually, the sand dollar is, is going to grow out of this little disc that's right here off of the gut. So that's its mouth. It's got these, these long arms, and it's feeding, and it's got a gut there that's full of food. And it's going to uh, undergo metamorphosis to become that. And that's a sand dollar, a Tranarachnius parma. It lives right out here in, in Frenchman's Bay. That The one uh, that I showed you in the movie was one that I raised in the lab. Um, so this is a sea urchin. Uh, and this is a green sea urchin. Uh, and actually, this is a larva. It's called a pluteus. And that's the sea urchin itself is this little group of cells here right off the side of the gut that's going to become the entire sea urchin is going to undergo metamorphosis and become this uh, strondulus and crotus trabachiensis, which lives out here in Frenchman's Bay as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but this is, this is fun. Uh, it's art meets science, so I'm going to this is not going to be my normal scientific talk. I'm going to take some artistic liberties and uh, hope that's okay. Um, but I think it fits with the theme. Um, so I'm going to talk about metamorphosis. I'm going to talk a lot about sea urchins. I used to work with sea urchins for actually most of my scientific career. Uh, so it's kind of fun to get to go back to that. But I'm going to start out. Okay, well, I'll just address the question, what is metamorphosis? This is my definition. It's relatively rapid and, and I would say rap, radically transformational change. And that's basically what happened, how you get a sea urchin out of a, a pluteus larva. Um, and it creates a new system. And in the sea urchin, that's a really good example of that because the body plan of an adult sea urchin or adult echinoderm of any kind is radically different than the body plan of the larva that gave rise to it. But let's go back in time. Let's go back. We were just hearing about spontaneous generation. Well, we don't have spontaneous generation now, but presumably at some point in Earth's history, we did spontaneously generate life, unless you believe that it came from outer space and was already preformed. That, that's an idea that's been around as well. But so this is this graph is just showing atmospheric oxygen on the planet since the planet was formed some four billion years ago. And you can see that at the beginning, at right at when the planet was first formed, there wasn't a lot of oxygen. There was actually no oxygen. Uh, and the planet formed um, via an accretion of uh, matter in the early solar system. And then at some point uh, in the first couple billion years, life spontaneously generated on the planet or was seeded from outer space, one or the other, but somehow arrived here, abiogenesis. And you had the first cell form. 
Um, and at some, at some point, there was a uh, event that photosynthesis came about. And after that, oxygen started going up in the atmosphere. It may not have been adequate or sufficient to have photosynthesis because oxygen reacts with things. Uh, so there, an, another idea is that there was also um, plate tectonics were beginning to happen at that time. And sub, uh, because of the subduction, carbon was being sucked under the crust and that allowed the oxygen to begin accumulating. And after that happened, uh, you started to get uh, a lot of endosymbiosis where um, cells were coming together. Uh, uh, prokaryotes formed the first eukaryotes and that happened over two billion years ago. And oxygen began rising and kind of plateaued. Um, and then much more recently, uh, well, there was a, a period of time where we had the snowball earth about 700 million years ago, where you had these rapid ice ages and you had glaciation that basically covered the earth. And oxygen really began to take off at that time. And that was when you had really the first complex uh, plants and animals, complex multicellularity happening. And um, the modern earth, so, so this, in, in a sense, was is kind of a metamorphosis of the planet. And one of the things that happened about um, that time, right after the, the snowball Earth and when complex plant and animals, was something called the Cambrian Explosion. Here's an artistic rendition of the Cambrian Explosion that kind of corresponded with that rise in oxygen. And it's thought that that might have been one of the things that triggered it. But all of the complex life forms that we know about now and that we are, um, animals and plants uh, came from the Cambrian explosion, and I'm going to talk about animals in particular in the animal family tree. And I, I think it's just an amazing thing to think about. This is, this is something I, it just still it blows my mind. I think about it a lot. We're all composed of cells. All the animals in the, on the planet, all the plants on the planet are composed of cells, and all those cells are descended from a common ancestor. So, um, we're all cousins, all distant cousins. And, and this is the animal family tree. And we know about this, of course, because uh, uh, Charles Darwin kind of illuminated us back in the 19th century. Um, and so I'm going to talk about this branch up here mostly, which is the deuterostome branch and, and our, our cousins, the sea urchins. And that was an artistic drawing. This is a more kind of, kind of tree that you would see in a scientific publication and showing the relationships between the different uh, families of animals. Okay, so we're going to first start out talking about deuterostomes and the echinoderms. So the echinoderms are sea urchins, like I showed you, sea stars, brittle stars, sea cucumbers, crinoids, uh, and they are a sister group along with the uh, hemichordates of the chordates, which include the vertebrates. So this is supposed to be a movie. Let's see if I can get it. Oh, well. So this is uh, the first three days of development of uh, the purple sea urchin, Strontulus and Protus purpuratus. Um, and you can see it goes from a fertilized egg to a, a pluteus larva here, um, which is a free living larval organism. It's got a mouth, it's got a nervous system, it's got a skeleton, it's got a gut, it's got a, a immune system, uh, it does everything that any uh, self-respecting animal would do. And it lives in the plankton for a time. And when it's in the plankton, uh, it feeds on phytoplankton. And so this is the same um, species going from what it looks like at about seven days up to 40 days. And, and these are to scale. This, these are actually really nice images that a research assistant I had, Allison Coluccio, when I first came here, took these on a confocal, Zeiss confocal microscope. These are actually just stained with DAPI. So this is just nuclei that are stained. And then I've just inverted it in Photoshop so you can see the outlines. And you have things, these, these dark things are ciliated bands. So they, these things swim around because they're covered with cilia on their arms and have these bands of cilia. 
Uh, but their, their main job is to feed and to form basically be a life support system for what's growing inside of them off the side of the gut, which is this rudiment, which is going to become the entire adult sea urchin. And so as they're feeding in the plankton, that is growing from a group of, of stem cells that are kind of set aside early, early on in development uh, and very quiescent up until this stage. And when they start feeding, those cells start dividing again, and they're going to form the entire adult. So this has a body axis. This is the mouth here. So this is kind of the anterior and the posterior uh, or the ventral dorsal axis. The adult that's, or the juvenile that's going to emerge via metamorphosis, the mouth is right here. So the axis is totally orthogonal to the body axis of the larva. It's a completely different body plan. So this one here has been feeding a bit longer and you can actually see this is on its kind of on its side and you can see these little little rings here, those are the, there are five tube feet that emerge. And so, uh, whereas the larva is bilaterally symmetrical, just like we are all are bilaterally symmetrical, the adult echinoderm is pentamerally symmetrical. So it's got a five part symmetry and it, it's, it's a secondary kind of radial symmetry that's been acquired uh, in this phylum. And so you got five tube feet, the adult's gonna emerge from this side. So here is the, the uh, sister species of uh, S. purpuratus. This is this um, purple sea urchins on the Pacific coast. On the, this coast here, we have Strongosynthrotus glovachiensis, the green sea urchin, and this is one from right out here in Frenchman's Bay. Uh, it's, it's just starting to feed. You can see this is this little part here off the side of the gut is going to become the, the urchin, and after it's been feeding for a while, uh, it's ready to settle, and this is a picture of one that's just undergoing metamorphosis. It's not a very good picture because I took it through my compound light microscope, and they don't, at this stage, they have hard shells just like sea urchins, so they don't transmit light, but I took the picture anyway because I'd never seen a sea urchin actually undergoing metamorphosis, and then it went, emerged, and became a baby sea urchin. So, um, uh, we were studying this in the lab for a while because it's a it's a very interesting example of developmental plasticity. So the the urchin larvae will not develop to the next stage uh, via metamorphosis unless they have enough food to do so. And there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is um, when resources are limiting, food resources are limiting, they use, basically use those, that energy to maintain themselves. And they, uh, the, lar the arms of the larvae will actually grow longer. So they actually channel the energy into larval maintenance and growth. The longer arms help them feed better and also uh, make them a little less attractive to predators. But if they're getting plenty of food, the resources go into forming um, uh, the, the juvenile rudiment. And so this was an experiment that the undergraduate, uh, University of Maine undergraduate did in the lab where he's just feeding different amounts of uh, phytoplankton. And you can see these, these are all the same age, but the ones that are getting fed more are developing the rudiment. Uh, if you treat them with rapamycin, you basically block that development. So it's interesting actually that the same kinds of things that we know that are regulating the rate of aging in humans, uh, dietary uh, intake um, and TOR, the kinase TOR, are also regulating this plasticity. Um, another thing that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute that does regulate uh, this and that they're getting from their food are thyroid hormones. So the sea urchins uh, metamorphosis depends on thyroid hormones, but they don't really make enough uh, these indirect developers to, to get to that. And, and uh, Andreas Halen at uh, University of Wolf, when he was a graduate student, showed that they actually get thyroid hormones from the phytoplankton they're eating. So um, this thyroid uh, hormone dependent metamorphosis, which you're going to hear more about in this meeting and which is very common, is very ancient in evolution, and, and uh, Andreas has proposed that early on it was something that was an environmental trigger, and the environmental uh, cue was the food that the the um, animals were eating. So this is this, this is what you get with sea urchins. You have here's uh, S. drabachiensis larva. Here's the what's going to become the juvenile rudiment, and then it's going to 
turn into this gear metamorphosis. Now, this is actually much smaller than this, obviously. This, this is about uh, um, just less than a millimeter in length, whereas this is much larger. And I already showed you Echinorachnius parma. That's also out from out here in Frenchman Bay. This is a sand dollar baby. It's going to become the sand dollar. So, but this is a not only something that happens in, in sea urchin sand dollars, it's something that happens with sea stars. So these are larval sea stars. Now I'm sh showing pictures that I've gotten off the internet. The pictures I've shown you before were ones that I made. But, so these are um, sea star bipinaria larvae that are going to become uh, an adult sea star via a process of metamorphosis. It's very similar to what I was talking about with sea urchins. Um, and then other echinoderms do that as well. But not all echinoderms undergo metamorphosis and have this kind of what's called indirect development. There are some species that have what's called direct development. So indirect development, like I've been talking about, is where you have two stages of the life cycle, one of which where an, an embryo that develops from a fertilized egg becomes a pluteus larva that is then going to be the life support system that gives rise to a... Um, a juvenile via this metamorphosis is dependent on food intake and, and, and thyroid hormones. But there are other species, and here's an example that basically bypass this, that develop directly into a juvenile. Okay, so, and here's two well-studied examples, and, and this was work that came from Rudy Raff's lab at the University of Indiana and his students and colleagues compared these two because these are two species that live in the same region off of the coast of Australia. And uh, Heliosideris tuberculata develops into a normal pluteus, whereas Heliosideris erythrogramma develops into this kind of, has a much larger egg and develops into this kind of uh, amorphous thing that is going to just go directly to a juvenile sea urchin without going through this metamorphosis process. So it's a really nice system for uh, evolutionary biology, uh, uh, study of evo devo evolutionary developmental biology, because the question is how how does the uh, genomic program of development get kind of rewired to allow for this? And and people like Greg Ray at Duke University have been studying that. And Greg actually just had a, a paper just came out uh, on that, looking at the changes in chromatin that were involved in that evolutionary change. So now I'm going to turn and just kind of do a survey of other animals uh, in, the, in the family tree because metamorphosis is something that happens throughout this tree and, and that gets back to the title of my talk, it, it being ancient and I think ancestral. So hemichordates, moving back from echinoderms uh, to the, our, the sister group of echinoderms is hemichordates, and they, they are things called acorn worms. And they have an indirect development that's very similar to that of echinoderms. So here is a larva of uh, an acorn worm, and it's going to undergo a, a metamorphosis to form this uh, hemichordate. So there are also direct developing hemichordates as well as these indirect developing hemichordates. So what about chordates? So chordates, of course, include vertebrates. We're all chordates, but in addition, they have uh, tunicates, which are kind of the, the base of that group, sea squirts, and cephalochordates, lancelets. Tunicates, or sea squirts, actually develop via a tadpole larvae shown here. So they have a tail, they're motile, they have a tail, they have a head, they have a central nervous system, they have a notochord. In fact, it's thought that our ancestors were very much like these, these tadpole larvae of uh, tunicates. But the adults, the sexually mature adults, are very different. They're these salps. They, they grow, they're sessile organisms that, that grow out here in the bay on on things like docks and, and, and rocks and so forth, and they spawn, broadcast spawners, but they, they just sit there and they filter feed. They, they uh, suck in water and, and eat plankton that comes in and blow it out. So this is a very fairly drastic metamorphosis that happens, and this is actually an interesting idea because we're more like the larvae of these than we are the adults, and 
and an idea that has been around for a while is is that maybe that we are uh, we evolved via a, a kind of a neoteny where our ancestors were more like the larvae of these things. That's just a just a speculation though at this point. So vertebr and that brings us to vertebrates and vertebrates, uh, as you all are very familiar with, uh, some vertebrates have also have tadpole larvae, and so this is frogs and toads and urines, which undergo a, a very dramatic um, uh, metamorphosis as well, from this uh, aquatic organism that that breathes water that uh, basically gets oxygen via gills from the water to a terrestrial animal that has lungs. And so this is this is just showing the kind of life cycle there, and it's it's kind of interesting because I already mentioned that food and thyroid hormones are very important for driving the, the metamorphosis of sea urchins, and that's also the case uh, with amphibians. Although in this case, they get their thyroid hormones entirely from within, uh, from the thyroid gland. This is interesting because this connects with the research that I'm doing in my lab now. Uh, I don't work with sea urchins anymore. I'm working with zebrafish, and we're looking at stress signaling and, and early life programming in response to stress. And this work uh, uh, that Dan Buckholz at the University of Cincinnati has, has shown that not only are thyroid hormones important for frog metamorphosis, but also corticosterone, uh, which is the, the equivalent of what we have, stress hormone cortisol, um, and a gene that is activated by thyroid hormones that is also activated by, by cortisol or corticosterone is KLF9, and that is involved in the, the metabolic and developmental reprogramming of metamorphosis. And that, to me, it's really interesting. It's just a coincidence because KLF9 right now is our favorite gene, and that's what we're working on in, in zebrafish, so I thought I'd point that out. And just a question that in my mind is that this raises is, is, is amphibian metamorphosis a response to desiccation stress? Because you, you have to, going back to looking at amphibians, they, they uh, basically evolved from fish and became terrestrial. And so was it the stress of drying up ponds that kind of drove this evolution? All right, so let's back up further. You know, insects and uh, or arthropods, crustaceans and insects also have metamorphosis, and you're all very familiar with the metamorphosis of, of butterflies and moths uh, from a chrysalis. Uh, not all insects have that kind of metamorphosis, so this is kind of similar to what I was talking about with the direct development versus indirect development in echinoderms. Some insects, uh, hemi metabolous insects, you don't have nearly as a dramatic transformation as in the whole metabolism. And backing up even further to um, uh, further down the family tree, cnidarians. So jellyfish, uh, sea anemones, hydra, what is happening with them? Well, that's actually really interesting. They have something that uh, is I think related to metamorphosis, but it's what's called metagenesis. So these animals have a complex life cycle where they have a part of their life cycle is um, asexually reproducing hydroids. So these, these are sessile organisms that produce polyps and they feed. And then some of the polyps will produce uh, a, another stage of the life cycle called a medusa. And the medusa is a sexually mature organism, but it's very different body plan than the, than the polyp, okay? <laughs> and then that, those, those will produce sperm and eggs, and then you get a fertilized egg, zygote, that is going to undergo development to produce a new polyp. So this is a, a complex life cycle with two different varied forms, and it's called metagenesis. And just to get back to, to sea urchins, um, this is a question that I don't have the answer to, but it's something I've been pondering because in sea urchins, there's this very interesting phenomenon that we tried to study in the lab, but I, it's, it's very hard to control, so it's not very amenable to experimentation. But the larvae, the pluteus larvae, not only give rise to a rudiment that is going to emerge as the juvenile that's going to become the adult, but in some circumstances, they will bud off small 
uh, buds that form small blastula that they will grow and develop into a secondary larva. And uh, that's been shown. I've actually seen it in the lab. Uh, I've seen them budding and I've, I've seen, uh, I've had dishes of larvae where I've had say 50 larvae and then I come in the next day and there are 100 larvae, uh, some of which are smaller than the others. So, um, but, and, and, and one of the triggers is the presence of predators that's been shown. Uh, that uh, if you put in uh, predators or, or cues from predators in the dish, they they will uh, they will bud or they will sometimes will split apart. So they can so basically these larvae can reproduce asexually in addition to forming this doing this metamorphosis. So a question that I have that I don't think that anyone has adequately answered is: Can the larvae actually live in the wild? and reproduce asexually uh, under certain conditions and have a kind of a form of metagenesis, not unlike that in Nidarians. And uh, I, I think that's still an open question. Um, it's hard to get funding to, to study something like that. So that's why we're not doing it. Um, so I'm gonna, the last thing I wanna talk about is a really interesting creature called, uh, the immortal jellyfish. And I don't know if anyone's seen the curious case of Benjamin Button, who this, this guy who de-developed, became younger. Well, this is a, a kind of a jellyfish that will form a medusa. And, and the medusa, if it's stressed, or actually these medusas can age and they undergo senescence. And when that happens, they have the capability of de-developing and undergoing uh, what I would term a reverse metamorphosis because the medusa normally is just a terminal stage of development that's sexually mature is going to reproduce uh, sexually. But for this species, they can de-develop and form, go back to forming a polyp. And so it's called the immortal jellyfish because it's thought that they could potentially be biologically immortal uh, via that way, um, not unlike asexually reproducing uh, organisms like hydra and, and some planaria. So um, metamorphosis is a, is a fascinating thing. I'm going to leave with one thing. I'm going to go completely in a different direction, but I just I had to put this in there. So I hope you forgive me for it. So some speculation. So I, I think about aging and senescence and, 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 and senescence, the way I think about it, it's a kind of an ed, end stage of development. And we, we now know, those of us who are, who are thinking about aging, that a lot of the things that happen in development are the things that drive aging. And as I just showed you with this immortal jellyfish, that senescence is something that can be escaped via a form of metamorphosis. So I just want to just reflect on our kind of situation in the world today, our socioeconomic systems. Those are things that undergo growth and development. And I would argue that that when they undergo unregulated growth and development, they enter a senescent state. And so, um, but you can also have social and socioeconomic metamorphosis. Think about the Renaissance uh, and there have been other periods in history. Um, I think it's interesting, it, it can be argued about this, but you know, it's an interesting question, was the Renaissance triggered by the Black Death and the opportunities that emerged with that? So the question I want to leave end with is, is will our civilization be able to undergo the adaptive metamorphosis that I, I would say that we need to have to save ourselves from the climate emergency and the, and the catastrophic environmental changes wrought by, by everything that we've done over the last 200 years of the industrial, because really, I mean, we're in a, in a pretty uh, bad state right now and we need some change. And if that happens, I think it's going to require some art and new stories. So I'll just end with that. Here we go. Well, Jim, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful talk, overview, some of the animals we know, uh, not in that form perhaps, and 
you left us with a lot of questions uh, for a beer and over a glass of wine. Questions? <laughs> differentiate does it actually lose mass does it become small yeah i think i think i've never seen it happen i've only read about this i, I just want to repeat the question okay. for the people listening in so when the jellyfish undergoes reverse metamorphosis does it actually shrink does it become smaller i believe not only it, younger i believe it does because there's a lot of apoptosis that happens that is accompanied with that to a thousand <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love to get some of those in the lab, but I think they're also very hard to uh, to raise. Why is the thyrotoma so important? Why is what? The thyrotoma. You have mentioned the thyrotoma about uh, five times. Well, it's a trigger, um, and you need it. I, you need it for sea urchin metamorphosis. Um, and they actually get it from their foods, which I think is fascinating. But you need it for metamorphosis of amphibians. Well, I know it from and, Briag that you need it for regeneration, and you need it for almost everything. But just this little gland sitting here, you know, which I know is important, but not that important, and you're telling me it's central? Well, it regulates metabolism, and, and metabolism is central. So. <laughs> yes. Can you talk oh. about the portions of the larva that don't end up being part of the um, the, the organism, the, the ones that develop indirectly? Yeah. Um, like, what's their function, and do they get absorbed into the, the final form? And uh, yeah, just are, are they about movement? Are they about um, protection of the developing? Yeah, that's I, I failed to mention that, so thanks for asking that. Um, there is a lot of programmed cell death, apoptosis that happens. Um, so a lot of the the larval tissues, when this gets triggered and and the metamorphosis is happening, yeah. undergo programmed cell death, and then they get absorbed into the gut of the uh, of the juvenile and used for food. Um, it's really a remarkable thing. I, I, the the closest thing I can think of to metamorphosis that happens in sea urchins is like when the alien emerges from the body of uh, the guy, on, if you've ever seen alien, because it's it comes out and, and, and then the, the larva itself is basically just kind of ripped open. I mean, that's a fascinating <laughs> subject. Uh, we have not thought about this talk, but Hollywood and metamorphosis would have been, uh, I think, a wonderful topic for the afternoon. Is there not any more questions if I could have the microphone yes. to you for Pamela? I mean, Pamela, you have the most difficult task of the afternoon. I mean, after we had a wonderful afternoon, I actually wouldn't have believed that we are only 15 minutes late, so, uh, which is nice. We have to be down there at the point at uh, 5.30 and even with a short uh, stroll down to the lower campus, we can do this. It says Pamela Smith. So. Okay. And and I will just close in the sense that I will um, uh, pose some questions that we can discuss over our eating our crustaceans um, and uh, also for discussion tomorrow. And you know we began by. Um, First of all, it was tremendously interesting day. Every single paper was absolutely um, wonderful and um, enlightening. And I've taken like the six pages of single space notes here. So I'm not going to go over them, don't worry. But my questions are, um, we began um, with the words of Albert Einstein, the ennobling man, they had the, the art, science and religion have the same aspirations of a nobling man, of creating representations of nature. Um, but my, and we ended with um, art can provide new narratives for, um, for our current predicament, which is quite dire. Um, and so I, what I want to ask is what 
can art and science work together today to respond to this dire situation? You know, are there insights that we can gain um, by bringing them together? And this is something that I'd love to talk about in the closing um, after tomorrow. You know, what are the kinds of things that the history of science or art history um, illuminate um, about the current um, methods and, and processes and ways of really um, investigating in scientific um, work today. So are there, um, is there something to say about pluralism and particularism versus reductionism? Mm -hmm. um, is there something to say about the place of human agency as against you know, the agency of nature, whatever we might think that is, but, you know, if we think about other kinds of earlier, different cultures, attitudes to nature, maybe there's something there that we can learn from today. Um, you know, are there lessons from history, from other kinds, from this now separate creative um, activity of investigation art, um, separated from science, I mean, that are important lessons for our present predicament or and for any moment, actually. You know, what is it that they illuminate art and science? Is it common? Is it different? Are there things that really we should take on board um, from both sides? So that was not just one question, that was many different <laughs> questions. Um, and that's what I'm posing here now. So, you know, we have only 28 minutes to get to the, um, wherever we need to go to, Forster Beach. Um, so if people want to comment, if people want to propose answers to this impossible question or simply to discuss, um, I don't know whether we have time to do it. Well, we have. Oh, we do. Okay. Or pose other questions. You know, um, Jim, when you said, for example, um, new narratives, what would those new narratives look like? I mean, I'm not asking you to answer that, but in your, but you know, would they would they focus on things like metamorphosis? Would they focus on things like the drying up of lakes? And so, you know, your um, focus of inquiry would become different in some way. Um, and that's the only thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to lift look at systems, and that's something I've been pushing at for a while. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is, uh, you know, we need to lay thinking some as a term of metaphor, and so we use that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm trying to say metamorphosis. Yeah, that's fair. That's wonderful. Um, let's see. Then how nice. am I spa? Oh, um, I have to. The notion of metaphor, I think it's metaphor and metamorphosis is very important because poetry is really, and painting are metaphor ways of thinking and visualizing. But uh, to respond, which is why we, um, art may be very helpful for us to do thinking with, and even re-looking at the art of the past with present knowledge might be a way for us to uh, bring forth some alternative understanding. Now that's problematic for historians because we really want to think about art at the moment it's made. Uh, and you know, interpretation, which can have a bad name, is when you're flinging on the past your current thoughts but I'm wondering, for me at least, some of the things I've seen today helps me, will help me rethink things that I saw and didn't understand in older painting. So I wonder if that's the way in which um, some of these stories, um, projecting it away onto the past, current thinking might help us understand through art, um, give us well, ideas for some solutions. What you're getting at, um, is something that has always struck me that there are these very long enduring sites of human engagement with the natural world 
and the kind of puzzling over the, what is going on, like metamorphosis, like regeneration, like, um, you know, the proliferation of unusual things um, that, uh, that have really, you know, people have been answering and working at for millennia and return to and you know maybe those structures of thought constrain us or maybe we should go back and look at the ways that other cultures or other um uh, times answered those questions or investigated them not answered them because they haven't been answered correctly i, I really enjoyed today's day actually I, i'm not a really a historian by no means uh, but, but what i enjoyed the most today uh, these are just comments like, you know, that um, uh, in the 50,000 years of human evolution, like the lot of the science related activities only began around this 14th, 15th century. And, and it was really eye opening for me to think like, you know, how they were debating about whether this is really a fossil versus uh, uh, how, how each of these processes they were described in the history. And that makes me wonder, like, Today, the science that we are doing, 100 years later, when another uh, art historian would be sitting, what would they be judging about today's uh, research, essentially? Thank you. Mm, yeah, well, the interesting, I'm a little bit afraid of that. <laughs> <laughs> First, we have uh, over there. Yeah. I've been thinking about, and maybe even uh, you, you've, you've prompted me to, to share this with, with everybody, but I've been thinking about the, the evidentiary um, uh, role that images play. And actually maybe an answer to your question is I mean, the thing that still may persist is actually the need for images to actually help make part of the argument or even to set forth speculative new directions for, for argumentation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's been, you know, especially the, the, the power of the images of the, the lizard tail um, experiments, or um, even looking at the, the development of the sea urchin, kind of drives home to me the the, the rhetorical value of images, and and the at least in my own naive um, uh, maybe uh, encounter with some of the scientific images, my my knee jerk reaction to take some of them at at face value, whereas you know give me an, a Renaissance painting and I will interrogate that uh, endlessly, as as you will. <laughs> have to suffer through tomorrow, um, but yeah. Yeah, but I do think that this period, the 16th century again is really, well, no, that's not true. Anyway, images are, have in, enormous power and they do still, you know, in, in science as well. I mean, they are a rhetoric, um, which I think is not sufficiently interrogated even by the non-naive. I mean, look at neuroscience and brain imaging, for example, um, has had some, a lot of, um, kind of naive interpretation. I think what we re have realized today and has been realized for many years is it's not nature and human. It's all of the earth is an organism. And just like we want to regrow human arms, it would be nice to regrow the health of the whole earth. Mm. And if art can contribute to that unity, the concept of unity, I think that would be terrific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I think this is this is sort of a response to your point, um, but also something that I've been thinking about a little bit, which is that I, I would find it very helpful to kind of historicize the work, the scientific work that is that has been presented um, and, and that will be presented tomorrow, and so just kind of thinking about like. What, it, what are the interests that are driving that, you know, what, how does it relate to work that came before and, and what does it reflect in terms of kind of the historical, you know, conjuncture that we find ourselves in? So, that, you know, maybe that's something that we can have as part of future conversations. Mm -hmm. I think we'll discuss some of it tomorrow. I mean, just maybe one question. <coughs> the speed is incredible. The speed, how, how we are producing science, the amount of science is just, hard to imagine and when you wait long enough like me for instance you just sit around for about uh, 35 years and all the things come up again <coughs> Briag and the people doing limb regeneration 
there is work which has been done a hundred years ago and all of a sudden it becomes better than began. So the, the historical aspects of that will be an important thing we can touch on. Yeah, I think that I'll just say one thing. I know you've had your hand up for a long time, but it, um, apropos of that, which is that um, one of um, the postdocs that we have in the Center for Science and Society has worked on um, on olfaction and what she really brought to the lab. She's a historian and philosopher, a philosopher and historian of science. And what she brought to that lab, that olfactory receptor lab, is um, you know the, the looking at older ideas that had gone nowhere and then have come back in re into resurgence. So it's a you know common or frequent phenomenon. Well, I was just thinking about the concept of the history of science and how, you know, certainly it would be a great topic for next year. We're celebrating our 125th um, anniversary, but there's such a great story here on this island about the connection between the natural world and how, you know, science really came to be, to be here. And it connects to conservation. It connects to all of those things that we've sort of touched on in, uh, in the conversation today. So it might be fun to think a little bit about an umbrella topic that might touch on some of those things. And to your point, um, Pamela, about, you know, use of, of art, of images in, um, you know, will they be relevant? How do we sort of utilize that as we go forward? And it just strikes me that that in, in the context of where we are in society in terms of how we communicate and how we take information in in these little tiny incremental <laughs> bursts these days with largely imagery. I mean, that's really what how people communicate, whether it's on your phone or whatever, but that is, I think, going to be even more important as we figure out how to potentially solve some of these big challenges is, is capturing people's attention and imagination and helping them visualize the relevance, the the impact of, of you know where we are and what's happening. So I see it as a great opportunity for more. Yeah, visualizing the deep past mm -hmm. and the and the imminent future. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and terrifying. <laughs> yeah, but that's a really good point about um, just how much we communicate in images and how important it is to think in a you know kind of theoretical way about visualization. And um, you know how much visualization has become really central to a lot of um, science, but also support of science. I think visualization is enormously important, but so many of the images with which we are currently um, presented are explanations or results rather than questions or inquiries. And I'm afraid we're becoming too comfortable with that role of images, not as asking right. questions, but as giving us the answers, which we're manipulating. Mm -hmm. So I, You mean in art history or in science? Well, I'm thinking, well, from visual culture, I'm thinking. Okay, yes. Yeah. So, uh -huh. But I think science may be using that language. I mean, this is a language of communication, and they may be acculturated mm -hmm. into that kind of communication language. Okay, um, well, I, it remains to me, I guess, to thank everybody who spoke today and who asked questions and was here in the room and in the Zoom room. Um, just a fantastic day. You know, Harriman was afraid we wouldn't have enough to talk about. <laughs> and I said, it'll be great. Um, and I, I hope that everyone agrees with me that it was great today. So thank you, everybody. I'll try to go through the deficit and then we'll go.